Jones, it's a pleasure to be invited back to join you here at New Horizons. As Dari mentioned, it's been my pleasure to meet with you on numerous occasions, uh, talking about the different destinations around the world that I've visited as a tour guide and as a speaker working on cruise ships, and as the uh, great history and scenery and the cultures that we encounter in these places. Now, I don't know of any one spot in the world that has probably more of all of that than Barcelona. We look at where we are over here in the northeastern tip of Spain, right there on the Mediterranean. Now, talking to several of you earlier before we began, of course, you visit Barcelona. It is a much visited attraction there throughout Europe, one of the most visited now in the world. When we look at the location there on the Mediterranean, it is the capital of one of the provinces there, Catalonia, Catalonia, depending on whether you're speaking the language of Catalan, which they have their own language there in that region of Spain. Uh, that's been the reason that there have been a number of movements going all the way back to the Middle Ages for an independent area there. Catalonia has, has part of Spain. It's not a federation. Spain is not a, a federation as we know it. It's a series of these different autonomous communities. It's a, officially listed as a decentralized unitary country. <clears throat> 17 of these autonomous communities around Spain, that means it gives them a little bit more in their local power of what they're able to do. In addition to those 17 autonomous communities on the mainland, there are the Canary Islands, which fly the Spanish flag, and there are two cities that are autonomous themselves. So you've got about 20 in this autonomous community setup that Spain operates under. Catalonia is the one we will be focusing on. Look at the Catalan language. It's not just spoken only in Barcelona. It's also down there in the Balearic Islands. That's Mallorca, Menorca, Ibiza, and Frontenera. And we visited some of those as well. Last summer, we were in three of the four of those. They're very popular tourist destinations. And that new Catalan language is also spoken on the island of Sardinia, which flies an Italian flag. But that's kind of interesting because they have about five different languages that they speak in Sardinia and the Catalan is one of those. When we see the crown and the bit of, of a heraldry that they have here in their crest, the city of the counts, and that has figured so prominently into the history of Barcelona, even after the time of the Romans, when it was a when most favored city. Most favored city. Most favorite city. Oops. 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 We look at the flag. Someone is not muted. Not muted. Yeah, let me let me. Nikki, let me see if I can uh, fix. Is that better? Oh, no. It's coming from Mary. Like a feedback. Yeah, she's got two devices. Is Mary? Mary? Um, well, I don't, maybe it's me. Let me let me mute myself. Let me mute myself here. I don't hear it now, Larry. Are we all muted or just yourself? No, it must be you, uh, Larry. It, it must be mine. Uh, well, it stopped now. I don't know. I don't hear it myself either. We're good to go? Yeah, we'll just go. And if it happens again, I'll, I'll mute myself. It's probably something with mine. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Uh, you're muted. You're muted, Nick. Uh, Nikki. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. yeah, you've muted me as well. Okay, now you're hearing me. Well, I think you can go ahead. Okay, you can hear me now. Yep. Okay, yep. Good. There is the flag of Catalonia. In addition to their own language, they have the provincial flag, the flag of Catalonia. The upper left and lower right, it's a cross of Saint George, and that's featured in the flag because that's the patron saint of the area. And then those vertical orange and red were from the crown of Aragon, which this was part of Spain. 
They've changed it recently. They're going to make those vertical uh, horizontal to more coincide with the flag of Spain, the red and orange, which is the flag, the national flag of Spain. When you see the city itself, it doesn't look that huge when you're looking just at the city limits. But like Birmingham, you look at the city limits and look at the metro area. Look at the metropolitan area here, 10 times the number of square miles that that city sprawls across the Mediterranean coast. And instead of a million and a half people it today, it's about 5 million people in that area. Number two in Spain, that's right behind Madrid. Only Madrid has more people than right here. Barcelona, as you see, is right on the Mediterranean and it was founded at the spot where two rivers come together. The two rivers up here in the Northeast were kind of like what you find on the Po River in Italy, where Venice was born, the estuary. Here you're looking at a satellite image of Barcelona and there is the Obergat and the Bissos. Right there in between is where a camp was founded by the ancient Carthaginians. Now, one of the stories that the city's founding is from the ancient Greek mythology. Heracles, translated into Hercules. By the way, all these ancient Greek gods had the great body. Then look at the, the washboard abs and the muscles of these guys. This was Her Hercules was supposed to have founded the city in his of mythology in Greece. Now, it's more likely that it was founded by the Carthaginians. Now, who and when were the Carthaginians in power? Well, ancient Phoenicia stretches today from what is Syria, Lebanon, and parts of Israel, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, these were great seafaring people in the ancient world. And from their bases in the Eastern Mediterranean, they spread all the way across southern part of Europe, northern Africa, and founding all these little trade settlements, which Barcelona would be one. Now, these people didn't confine themselves to the Med. They went all the way out to the Canary Islands and then up the coast of Western Europe. And pretty soon, these little trade settlements became colonies. People began living there full time rather than just in a trading bit. Now, there is ancient Carthage. This is one of the cities and the people founded by the Phoenicians about the 8th century before Christ. This is 300 years even before ancient Greece. Now, could it be that one of the military leaders there, who would be the father of Hannibal, would be the man who first founded it? Hamilcar, Barcina, probably developed into Barcelona. This was their family name, Hamilcar Barca. Now, it's at the time when the Iberian tribes were being subjugated by the Carthaginian people. Carthage was expanding from what it was as an empire in North Africa, and they would clash with Rome. Now, the father of Hannibal, a military man, had his son take a blood oath, swear that you will never be a friend to Rome. And little Hamilton did exactly that. As soon as age will permit, I will use fire and steel to arrest the destiny of Rome. And they laughed at him as a little boy, but he would be instrumental in pursuing that policy. Rome at the time was moving southward. Carthage was moving northward. It's inevitable then that those two great empires would clash. And they did clash in what would be one of the most destructive series of wars in history. It's called the Punic Wars from the Latin word for Phoenicia, Punic lasted for about a hundred years and two of the great military leaders of the day, Hannibal and his counterpart in Rome, Scipio Africanus would take the stage. And mil many military historians feel that this was the most destructive wars in history because of not only the casualties, but its far reaching effects in how it would affect Carthage and how it would affect Rome. Leader was Hannibal, born about the middle of the third century before Christ, his counterpart was 11 years old, 11 years younger, I'm sorry, Scipio Africanus, who would be the leader of the Romans. Both of these guys were what were called in the military army brats. Their fathers were in the military. Hamilcar, the father of Hannibal, would be killed fighting people in Spain, Hispania. Hannibal then would assume command of those armies. His counterpart, 11 years younger, would be born into a noble family in Rome. He didn't have to go into the military, but he felt it was his duty, and he did. Scipio, even the name that was given, means rod or staff, he's supposed to be able to strike, and that's what he would do. Now, it's interesting that when he was serving with his father in the military, he had the, I guess it would be an honor or a distinction, and certainly a, a, a unusual circumstance of saving his father's life when he was just 18 years old, when he was battling. Now, Scipio had a bad time of it with the legions in Hispania. Everywhere they were fighting Hannibal, they were losing. Hannibal's armies were victorious throughout the area. 
Something had to be done. Scipio was just 36 years old. When he asked Rome, he said, put me in command of these armies. Well, that might seem kind of an unusual command for a uh, request from a 36 year old, but they said, well, how much worse can I do? Look what's happening to us. We're being beaten everywhere we're fighting Hispania. So he took control of the armies of the Romans and there they would clash in the second Punic War. There would be three. This is particularly one that would send the destiny of both of those empires. From there in Barcelona, Hannibal decided he was not gonna do what the Romans expected. He was gonna take his army through the back door. Rome was expecting a frontal assault from the ocean, but Hannibal decided that he was gonna go from Barcelona over the Pyrenees, the back way into Rome. Now look what that involved. He had to cross these mountains. And again, this is the third century before Christ. You move on your stomach, you move carrying everything that you need with you. Well, the Pyrenees were kind of a formidable obstacle, but they were nothing compared to what he would encounter after he crossed the Pyrenees and then to have to go over the tallest mountains in Europe. After the Pyrenees came the Alps. Had quite a journey going over the Alps. He would lose about half of his army doing that. But here's where he established himself, leaving from Barcelona as a great military tactician. When the first of his day, the father of strategy, at West Point, his picture is everywhere when he talked about what this man did, moving an army over the Alps in the way they had to do it 2,200 years ago. He'd be the first to utilize tanks in warfare, and the tanks were these giant elephants coming from Africa. Of course, he had all of these elephants with him, moving out of Barcelona, crossing the Pyrenees, crossing the Alps. And then he would fight Rome for the next 13 years, moving up and down the boot of Italy. And everywhere, again, that he fought the Romans, he defeated the Romans. Two entire Roman armies were defeated by the Carthaginians under Hannibal. He never was able to deliver the knockout punch, though. Finally, there was nothing between his armies and Rome itself after these 13 years of maneuvering down through there. The Romans figured out the only way to get him out of here is to attack his homeland, and they did that. They invaded Carthage, and at the Great Battle of Zama in 202 BC, what's considered by military historians as one of the turning points of history. Had the Carthaginians prevailed in this battle, the great Roman civilization, which became a Roman empire, would never have developed. But the Carthaginians were defeated. Hannibal and his forces were finally defeated. This empire that stretched across North Africa and parts of Southern Europe was now gone. Rome made sure at the end of these Punic Wars that the Carthaginians and Barcelona would never ever threaten Rome again. They even salted the earth to make sure that for a generation, nothing would even grow there. When we take our true groups to visit Tunisia, we'll see ancient Carthage. And this is where the ships left from to go to Barcelona to begin that crossing. Now, after the defeat of the Carthaginians, Barcelona became part of the expanding Roman empire. Here it is at its peak in the second century after Christ. It stretched from Britannia all the way to the gates of Jerusalem. There, the Roman Empire was at its peak. Barcelona would achieve a very favored city status under the Romans. It was a great trade center. And there, it would flourish and become more and more popular on the Mediterranean. If you visit in the area today, there is the Roman ruins under the barrio in the, in the Catalan language is barrio in Spanish, which is a neighborhood, the Gothic barrio. Many of these, they have opened up now to tourists and you can see what was there during the time of the Carthaginians and the Romans. And then Rome would have its own fall as well. By the early part of the fifth century before Christ in 410, Alaric and his Vis Visigoths would for the first time break down the barrier that was Rome. They sacked Rome. 40 years later, we would see Gezeric and the Vandals come in and take what the guys didn't take the first time around. And then 20 years after that, Rome was finished. The final emperor in the Western part of the empire was deposed in the fifth century after Christ. The empire would exist for another thousand years at Constantinople, which is today Istanbul, until it fell in 1453. But the empire in the West was finished. All of a sudden now, crossing the Iberian Peninsula and into Barcelona would be the different invaders. The ones that had knocked down the walls of Rome, the Goths, the Visigoths, the Vandals, all were now flooding into the Iberian Peninsula. It would be the Visigoths that would set up shop and pretty much rule that peninsula for the next couple of centuries. By the eighth century, Barcelona and the rest of the peninsula would see another invader. These were the Moors, the armies of Islam crossing over the narrow straits of Gibraltar 
and begin their northward journey all the way into Europe, finally turn back at the gates of Vienna. But here during this time, the Arabs and the Berber pirates from along the coast of the Mediterranean would move into this Mediterranean area along the coast where Barcelona was located and it would have a distinct flavor in the architecture and the customs that they would acquire then. And then we would see the role that Charles the Great, Charlemagne in French, Charlemagne, he would be the one who would bring all of these Frankish little kingdoms into a great empire, the first empire of France. Now, how would that affect Catalonia and the city of Barcelona? Well, this was a buffer zone down here, right? Where you see the area lit up, it was called the Spanish March. It's right on the border of what is today of Spain and France, the country of Andorra is located right in the middle of that. Now the Counts, we talked about the city of the Counts, was ruled at this time. So this provided a buffer between this expanding French empire and what was Catalonia. And then the Black Death. This was the, the plague that's toured Europe all over the beginning of the 14th century, the middle of the 14th century, for about the next seven years, we would see a staggering number of deaths from this disease that came from the East. Now the origin was probably somewhere over here in Ukraine. Right here, we would see the map as it sees how this plague would spread over the years throughout Europe. Now it began over here and the spread was from Genoa in Italy. Now why Genoa? Well, Genoa was one of the great maritime republics. There wouldn't be an, an Italy until 1861 with Garibaldi. But here Genoa was one of these maritime republics that had a great fleet of vessels that covered from the Crimea over there in the Black Sea all the way up to the British Isles across the Mediterranean. Their great fleet of ships would be infested with rats. Rats then would carry the flea and this is a bacteria in the flea called Yersinia pestis that would spread that disease. The rat was only the conveyor. This was the bad guy. This photograph here from electron microscope shows a flea just after having ingested a meal of blood. Later when that bacteria infested, it becomes black like that. It became the black death. And there would great across Europe, this popular cartoon of the day showed dancing death. Could there have been as many as 200 million people die? We'll never know the exact because they didn't have the record keeping accuracy that we have today, but anywhere from 75 to 200 million people probably perished in that Black Death before it finally was eradicated. That's as much as 60% of the population in Europe at the time and about a third of the population in the Middle East. We look at the population of the world, half a billion people could have shrunk to as few as 350 million. Kind of staggering, even with the numbers that we have today, when we look at what happened during the Black Death. The economic and social upheaval that took place with that. We see all of the infrastructure projects put on hold. There can be no more cities, bridges, all of the social services provided to people were now gone. It's just a matter of trying to get people underground, burying them in time. Barcelona, like the rest of Europe, would suffer terribly. It was about a two year period, the number of thousands, they don't again have the exact count, but the number is in the thousands of people in Barcelona who died during the Black Death. This is what Spain looked like at the time. It was a collection of kingdoms from Galicia and Navarre and Catalonia and Aragon in the north, all the way down to Granada in the south. Now, this particular part of the story that figures for us was part of the kingdom of Aragon. Now, when you see the crowns, Spanish for crown is corona, you see the corona de Aragon. That was about 1400. They had their own laws, what they call them the Catalona Fueros. Fueros are a type of laws that provided some sense of justice for these people in that area. Now, this was again unique and it gave them again their claim to some type of a semblance of we need to be our own independent area here. We have our own laws, our own language, our own customs. And then what would change the course of Spain would be the marriage of two teenagers in 1469. We would see 18 year old Isabella, the queen of Castile, marry a man who was a year younger than her, King Ferdinand of Aragon. And by the way, if I was either of these two monarchs and the royal portrait painter gave me this as the work that they had done, I would have them both executed. This, uh, this is not the type of work you wanna to present to a king or queen Said so this is the best we could do for you. What it did, however, was to unite into a, a, a España, a great Spain 
that would now compete with Portugal as the two great superpowers of the day. It would be 100 years before the British, the French, and the Dutch would compete for colonies around the world. But right now, it's Spain with his two monarchs. Even the Pope himself, Alexander VI, decided to consecrate this wedding. He said, we are now creating a Catholic Spain for Catholic Spaniards, or Reyes Catholicos, the Catholic monarchs. And they would begin this ethnic cleansing. Again, that Barcelona would be part of that as being part of Spain. They're gonna get rid of the Jews. They're gonna get rid of the Moors, all the people of the Islamic faith. And it finally ended in 1492, a very important date, Christopher Columbus, of course, but that's when Ferdinand and Isabella accepted the surrender of the last armies of the Moors in Spain, and that would be in the south in Granada. So now Spain is in its golden age. Now Barcelona wouldn't really figure into the golden age of exploration. It would be more Cadiz there under the south where all these ships were leaving from. But it would benefit from that because being on the Mediterranean, many of these ships were leaving from those areas. Then we would see the revolt that would take place against the King of Spain in the people of Catalan. It would be called the Reaper's War. And this was a pretty big bit of military action. It only took place over about a year, but a number of thousands of people would be killed during this war. Again, the very first time that a separatist movement for an independent Catalan would take place. We think about it today in the last few years that we've seen it, but look, this goes back 400 years almost. During that time, the Spanish crown prevailed, part of Catalonia was ceded to France. Again, bringing forth some very hard feelings from the people of Catalonia with the Spanish government. By the 16th and the 17th century, that separatist movement is really gaining some traction. More and more people are feeling that this should be an independent, complete city state. We see something that took place over here. This is one of the main attractions in Barcelona is this fortress over or the harbor that was built in the 18th century, where during this time, a Frenchman established the official length of a meter. What is exactly a meter? And there it was presented to the French parliament at that time. We would see the Napoleonic Wars figure very prominently in the history of Barcelona and all of Spain. Napoleon, of course, picked up the pieces after the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror, and he would fight in Spain in what would be called the Peninsular Campaign, the Iberian Peninsula. A couple of great battles were fought there, but the Spanish would be defeated. What that would mean would then Napoleon, after accepting the surrender of Spain, would put his brother, Joseph Bonaparte, on the throne. We continue then on after the Napoleonic Wars, we would see Waterloo would be the finish of Napoleon. He's banished to the island where he would die in the North Atlantic, St. Helena. Now, following that, we would see the beginning of the great Industrial Revolution. Industrial Revolution taking place from England throughout Europe, eventually to the United States we'd see the little home cottage industries being replaced by factories, industrialization, steam power. Spain would figure prominently in that as well. And many people from different parts of Spain were being attracted to Barcelona as a manufacturing center. And then in the 20th century, coming in, in the lifetime of many of us to look back and see what was happening during the Spanish Civil War. Francisco Franco, they call him Cabillo de España, would be the forces of Franco going against the forces of the Republic of Spain. Devastating civil war that lasted for three years and Barcelona happened to be on the wrong side. They were a Republican stronghold. Many of the civilians of Barcelona would flee the city going up to that contested area with France right along the border. And they stayed there. Barcelona was bombed and heavily damaged during the time as the forces of Franco were moving steadily into that area. Finally, End of January of 1939, the city would fall. And 1939 would figure prominently in the history of Spain and in Barcelona, because we would see with Franco's feet being successful, Barcelona was all of a sudden the least favored status. You're not gonna have any more autonomous institutions. You're not gonna fly the flag of Catalonia. You are barge speaking even the Catalan language. So they're pretty much on the wrong side of this fight. Then that same year, we would see Europe go to war. August is when Hitler ordered his troops into Poland and see the Europeans beginning war that would start to the Americans two more years. But Spain during this time declaring its neutrality. They had just finished a terrible war among themselves. They're not gonna fight in the European war. Franco would hold power until his death in 1975. 
man who long lived now queen elizabeth has outstripped him she's celebrating her 75th franco happy to have 30 years in power it would be at that time then the renaissance the renaissance would begin again the idea of a free and independent catalonia no longer part of spain it had begun way back in the 19th century when this man first raised it. oops something kicked us off there our screen sharing here we are the man named Masia would be the one who would found a party that would establish a Catalan state in 1922, Estat Catala, and that would lead to a republic, a Catalan republic, but it's only in their minds. They haven't done anything legally at this time. Now, recently we've seen this pro-independence movement fueled by an argument that makes a lot of sense, especially to the people in that area. They said, we have our own language. We have ancient customs dating back even before the Romans. We have our own laws. He said, and in 2014, we paid 10 billion more in euros in taxes than what we received in social services and in infrastructure improvements. So they've had a pretty good case going for them here. Why would Spain be so much against that? Well, the city itself is the most powerful gross domestic product of any city in the US. EU is three ahead of them, this is number four. So they are generating so much from social services and from tourism. We would see what happened in Gibraltar take place here in Barcelona. This was in 2013 when people got together to hold hands for about 240 miles, that's 400 kilometers. They did that in Gibraltar all the way around the rock there at the tip of the Iberian Peninsula when they were gonna have a vote as to whether or not they wanted to be part of Great Britain or be part of Spain. Well, a million and a half people turned out for this to join hands all the way this 400 kilometer, 250 mile Catalan way that they had at the time. We would see how more power the idea took hold. 2003, there were maybe 14% of the people were in favor of an independent Catalan. 15 years later, 41% were in favor of that. When you look at the newspaper polls, we see again, almost doubling in popularity from 33 to 58% of the people in the area felt they should have an independent Catalonia. We would see this just a few years ago, thousands of people taking to the streets with the idea of separatist movement, moving away from that. It'd be led by this man, Carlos Puigdemont. And Puigdemont would grow up in a family of people who were very much for an independent Catalonia. He would become a journalist and become an activist and get into the government himself. He's elected president of the government of Catalonia. Again, this is one of the autonomous communities. They have a good, and by the way, many women tell me they'd love to have a head of hair like this guy has. A very good picture of him right there. And the man would be involved in this movement in 2017 when they came to the forefront and decided we're gonna hold an election now to whether or not we want to be independent from Spain our own republic. Well, the Spanish government in Madrid said that election is not legal or binding in any way, but they would hold the election. The unionists were very much opposed to it. They wanted to remain part of Spain. So you've got these two opposing factions that would come together in what would be called the Catalan Independence Referendum. It was held in October of 2017. And look at the number of people that participated. About 40% came out to vote, five and a half million eligible voters, two and a quarter million voted. They came out 92% voting for independence. That's almost the same 98% in Gibraltar that voted to remain part of the United Kingdom as a British overseas territory. So you've got over 90% of the people voting. That led to this, clashes between those two groups, police kind of in the middle. You've got to enforce the law, but you've got to keep the peace as well. And then in October, just a three weeks after that election, Puigdemont would declare the Catalan independence based on the 92% who voted for independence of the territory. Well, it didn't do anything. It completely crumbled and he would go into exile in Belgium. It's been called a political exile, a self-imposed exile, and because also a fugitive from justice. He was gonna be arrested in Spain. So he's living in Belgium. He's arrested several times now, and most recently, just in September of last year, he was arrested when he deplaned in Sardinia. 
He was held overnight in a prison, but then they released him the next day. No one who has arrested him, including Germany, Italy, and Sardinia, has extradited him to Spain. They refused to extradite him based on him being a revolutionary. If they change that law, maybe he will be, but right now he's still in a self-imposed exile. This man came to power when he was gone, and he also is a separatist. Kim Torah would be the man who would rule for two years until Spain finally took back control completely and said, we're not having this anymore. In May of 2018, the prime minister said, we want understanding and harmony, but we will not tolerate the breaking of laws. Any breaking of the laws and Spain's constitution are not going to be tolerated. So it's still in a limbo position today. That separatist movement is still underway. Uh, it certainly has lost some steam with their figurehead being in a self-imposed exile, but there are others who still very much want an independent Catalonia. Here is the city today. I mentioned earlier, that it's the fourth most visited city in all of Europe. If you're going there in the summer, you're going to have huge crowds. Prime time for visiting, of course, is spring, uh, winter time, if you can do the winter time, and then in late fall, we we'll see the immigration that began during the Industrial Revolution continuing today. A lot of people are going into these areas from Andalusia, from Murcia, from Galicia. It has become one of the largest ports in Europe. And we say port plural because there are more than one port. They have a shipping container port and then the port that we use, the passenger vessels. The container port, it ranks number nine in all of Europe. Now that's pretty good to be in the top 10 with competitors like Marseille, Athens, and some of the others. Now they move about two and a half million TE, what's a TEU? The TEUs are containers, it's 20 foot equivalent unit. And this would determine the size of a ship that can go through the Panama Canal, which we just did recently. Those containers are six foot by eight foot by 20 foot. They call them 20 foot equivalent units. So that's moving a lot of them in 2019, just before the COVID started shutting down some of the international commerce. Now, one of the great attractions of the city is right there in the port itself, the old port. We think, well, what's so exciting about a port? It's what is there. This attracts the world every year when they sell out the World Trade Center in Barcelona. This and all the attractions there were built on landfill, reclaimed from the ocean. The Great Park, the Forum Park, it's got everything there from the Trade Center. There are hotels. There's all type of amusements, including what I think is not just the largest aquarium in Europe, but I think the finest one. You walk through a kind of a, a tunnel way here and the fish are swarming all around you, up close with some wonderful photos. And then one of the best way to see it is right here with the Telefric. It's almost a mile long and the thing goes in a beautiful area, takes you right down to the Trade Center and here the heart of the town. There is a famous statue right there. The big building that you see just to the right is the Customs House and some of the government offices that are there. Right next to that is the statue of who? Cristobal Colon, Christopher Columbus. Now Columbus was never in Barcelona, even though he did sail under the flag of Spain, he sold his idea to Ferdinand and his fella of sailing west to arrive in the east. He sailed out of the east western coast of Spain. This of course is on the east coast, but they have the statue of Columbus there. And of course he's pointing westward, always to the west. Now, the great thing about Barcelona visiting there is that many of the most important attractions are very closely centered right here. This is La Rambla, a great downtown road that is a pedestrian and part of it, a motorized area. And then three of the great attractions here. Two of them are houses and one of them is the Sagrada Familia. It's most famous of the cathedrals. Take a look at some of these. This is La Rambla. This, everyone that gravitates to Barcelona, gravitates right here. La Rambla is this great area that runs from the port all the way into the heart of town. Along the way are restaurants and coffee shops and bars, all the outdoor activities that are taking place here in the spring and the summer with different artists. And what I think are some of the most incredible mimes, the street people in the world. Now, the one in the center, it took me an hour to try to figure out how she is suspended like that. But these are some of the most clever mimes that you find anywhere in the world, all along La Rambla. Very creative people. And everyone wants to go into Mercat San Josep, St. Joseph's Market. And whether you're shopping for anything or just wandering, you've got to go into St. Joseph's Market 
to have a look at what the locals are doing. They're shopping for everything from the spices, all types of dried fruit, vegetables, any type of cheeses from all the different provinces, not just here in Catalonia, but around Spain, and very fine cheeses, olive oils, seafood, fish, and some of the best olives in the world, the Spanish olives, from which the Spanish olive oil is extracted. And then the other attractions relate to this man, one of the great architects of the 19th and early 20th century, Gaudí, probably the most famous of his city's sons. Of the dozen or so monuments to Gaudí around, the different buildings that he designed, there are three of them that we want to look at with the time that we have available. Two of them are houses, and one of them is the great cathedral. The first of the houses is this one, Casa or House Batlo. This is a strange looking building. It looks like bones. It's called Casa de Sos, the House of Bones. It has a type of a skeletal quality. It really began Gaudi's career as a famous architect. Now, Joseph Batlo, his wife and four children moved into the house in 1904 that had been built in the 1870s. Now they wanted to redo the house and they charged Gaudi with redoing, it, but not just an upgrade or redesign. He said, we want a house that doesn't have a single straight line. I think what a challenge that is. So Gaudi accepted that challenge and he began. And when you look at it today, there is not a single straight line anywhere in that house, outside or inside. The facade was ceramic tiles that were crushed and broken, made kind of an interesting bit of a, of a facade for the outside. Even on the inside, you're gonna find all the curve, the stairway, you don't have a straight line inside. When you get up to the roof, you see what looks like the back of a dragon. And there's a lance in the dragon, supposedly St. George killing the dragon, St. George, the patron saint of Catalonia. And there is the back of the dragon with the lance of St. George. Again, crooked, not a single straight line in it. When you look at the different chimneys, they're not in a straight line either. As you'll see in a moment, that's supposed to be more effective for the release of smoke. But there the chimneys are even curved. So Gaudí accomplished what he was charged with doing. And in 2005, UNESCO made this a World Heritage Site. UNESCO is the United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Any type of building or bridge or a city or some particular locality is more important, not just to the area in which it's located, but to the world itself. It gets UNESCO World Heritage status. And that site does have that now. The other one is La Pedrera, the quarry, another house for a man named Mila. Casa Mila was, and you'll see here, Per Mila y Camps. Now the Y is and, so Mila and Camps are the paternal and the maternal names of the family. They use not just the father's name, but the mother as well, Mila and Camps. Now that was built in 1906. Gaudí was gonna design and rebuilt it completely. And he did exactly that. Now, the great fame and the claim that he received from the Batlow house did not come wrong with here. Here the neighbors hated this. They thought it was an eyesore. Pretty much ignored the Mila family when they were living there. But after that, it has become a tourist attraction today. And again, that great status, not a single load bearing wall here. The self-supporting stone throughout the exterior, the interior, you just move from the inside to the outside in this great building that he has, each floor surrounded and supported. The roof is the same way. They have these curved bits of chimneys. They have what's called the Garden of the Warriors, which is supposed to be knights, the helmet of a knight on top of these chimneys. They don't have the dragon, but these protect the skylights. And again, they're supposed to be more efficient for the escaping of smoke, have a curved rather than a straight chimney. Look at the house at night, you see how beautifully it lit up. It is a major tourist attraction. And now the tenants who live there actually enjoy the interaction that they share. The last thing we'll look at is the Holy Family, Sagrada Familia. And this again, it has a great story. Groundbreaking began in 1882. When did it finish? It isn't. Will it be later on in this decade? Don't know. Most people say no, it will go much, much further. Now, this was the work of Gaudi. He began in 1882, but look when they finally got a building permit, not until just a few years ago. Not until just a few years ago, they got the actual building permit. And what they thought was gonna cost about four and a half million pounds is gonna now, which is to about five and a quarter million dollars. It's gonna exceed that by the time it's completed. Will it be completed? Well, they talk about the, the exact name 
The official name is the Basilica and the Expiatory Church of the Holy Family, Sagrada Familia. 2010 is when the Pope came to visit. He was Pope Benedict XVI at the time. He's gonna consecrate it, but other popes had visited as well. The styles of architecture that Gaudi incorporated into this just cover pretty much everything, the Gothic, the Art Nouveau style. You can see the work that's being done today as they are upgrading and trying to restore what was done from the 1880s. Now, one writer said this is the most extraordinary personal interpretation of Gothic architecture since the Middle Ages. It certainly is that. It certainly is that, and it may be an understatement. When we look at the other man said, it's impossible to find another church building like it in the entire history of art. Even the great cathedrals along the Rhine in Germany and in places in Europe, they're just not anywhere near this grandeur. I mentioned another Pope, he came here to look at it Gaudi, the man in the beard next to the Pope, was being questioned by the Pope. He said, this is taking you a long time. This is in the 1920s now. You began in 1882. What's taking you so long? He said, well, my client's not in a hurry. Gaudi say that pretty well. No, God's not in a hurry. He wants it done right. And he would. He would complete that. The problem was that much of it was funded by private donations. It wasn't a government-sponsored project. So they had to re rely on much of what the people we're putting into this. Gaudi died in 1926, so it's much more difficult now to donate to a fund that he's not leading. And then with the Spanish Civil War for those three years in the 1930s, not much was being donated at all. People were just trying to stay alive during the Civil War. It's picked up speed again though now, and people are working. And these are real artisans, whether they're working at, at the foot of the parlor or up in the top seat. The old right next to the new, and you see how they've almost identically created what was done from the 1880s, all of this new work. When you look at the three facades, people are asked, which is their favorite? This is one that some people, the glory facade, it's not mine. Mine is this one on the left. It's called the passion facade. Some people like this one, the nativity. These towers are what's so in incredible here too. You go up and see the work close up of these different statues, all the different events depicting the life of Christ, the saints, all this incorporated into this great Gothic cathedral. And the people working on this today are aerialists. These guys hook up just like you are when you're climbing or repelling in some type of a, of a mountain setting. They're doing the same exact thing up here, hanging off of these incredible towers as they repair and restore what they, even the guys working inside, they're taking great pride and great pains in what they're doing. All the restoration work that's taking place all around here. When you see what they have done and how closely they have matched using natural lighting and some of the lighting that has been provided here with the beautiful stained glass windows and the beautiful facades inside as well as the outside. Now these 18 spires, this is a model of what it's gonna be when it's completed. It's supposed to be Christ, the Virgin Mary, the four of the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospels, and then the 12 disciples, 18. 18 of those fires when it's finally completed. When will it be? Well, we don't know. We still see the work that's taking place, all the scaffolding that remains around it, but some of the great views during the daytime when you visit or looking at night. Now it's been acclaimed by architects from both sides of what they feel this should be. American Lewis Sullivan said the greatest piece of creative architecture in the last 25 years, spirit symbolized in stone. And then we know the writer, this man, an architect, Walter Gropius, also commented, he said, it's a marvel of technical perfection. Not everybody, however, is impressed with what they've done. George Orwell, another writer, one of the most hideous buildings in the world. He didn't mince any words. Gerald Brennan, a man from England who was living in Spain for most of his life, said it's not even in European architecture of the period can one discover anything so vulgar or pretentious. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, is it not? James A. Michener, one of our favorite writers, one of the strangest looking serious buildings in the world. He kind of sat on the fence there. He didn't go one way or the other. Called it a strange looking serious building. But again, looking at it at night, even when the cranes are lit up, it's just a magnificent piece of architecture and one of the focal points of the city right there in the heart of Barcelona. Now the city has achieved something that no other city in the world has ever received. Think of it, not just Europe, but anywhere in the world. 
It was back in 1999 when the city of Barcelona received the Royal Institute of British Architects gold medal. That's the first and the only time that a non-architect has received that award. It's always gone to an architect. Here the city received it because of all of its great architectural wonders. They gotta be on your lists when you visit the city to pick up these sites of Gaudi. Something that looks like the heart of France on the Champs-Élysées, this is the Arc de Triomphe of Barcelona. Same almost exact pattern. We see also something that's kind of a scaled down version. Well, of course, like the great cathedral, it's not Sagrada Familia, but the Barcelona Cathedral itself is very beautiful. We look at other sites here, Castle of the Three Dragons, which brings to mind some of the Moorish occupation of the Iberian Peninsula. We see some of the architecture inside, some of the Andalusian architecture, some that was brought over from North Africa by the Berbers. All of these different sites here are complemented by what the world saw when they came to Barcelona in 1992. We just finished the winter games here. These were the summer games hosted in Barcelona in 1992. Many of the venues are still in use today, including the soccer field, football for them, the largest in all of Europe. Nowhere in Europe is there a larger stadium than here in Barcelona. They also are stopped on the Formula One racing circuit, Circuit de Catalunya. Also one of the premier sites that's in on everybody's bucket list. If you don't attend an event there, at least to go there to have a look at the Opera House the incredible architectural wonders, splendors inside, beautiful sounds that you hear there. And then La Placa Catalunya, this is where the locals gather as well as tourists. There's a great meeting spot. The La Rambla takes you right up to that, leaving from the port, the ocean, right to it. It's such a popular city that 25 different cities around the world, from St. Petersburg, we see over here in, in Constantinople, Istanbul, there on the left, up and right, Rio de Janeiro. You go to Budapest, you go to, all of these cities have signed on to be a sister city of Barcelona. And it is a number of these World Heritage sites right there. Eight of them, that's as many as Rome will have. So again, they are replete with any type of history, with scenery, with culture, looking at the great magic that's lit up at night to see the fountain. So Barcelona is, uh, again, one of the focal points of Europe for people who want to combine a visit with great history, some spectacular architect scenery, and a wonderful culture of the people of Catalonia. Now, if you'd like to unmute yourselves, I'll be glad to try to answer questions that you might have on what you've just seen. I've thrown a lot at you in the last 50 minutes, but hopefully you've enjoyed that uh, look at one of the great cities of the world. Well, Nikki, I'll ask a question, but it's not specific to Barcelona. If you could go someplace tomorrow and it wasn't, you know, we had no problem with the pandemic, what, what city in Europe would you pick as your favorite to go to? Uh, it's a toss up for me between uh, London and with um, ooh, uh, Roman, Roman Ath Athens tugs at me because my, my grandparents came from Greece, yeah. but I just love going back there. But London, uh, just for me, has it all as well. Um, London, maybe, uh, well, both of them right now uh, would be much easier to visit than they were last summer when, when we were going there uh, because uh, England has, uh, well, the United Kingdom has lifted their COVID uh, protocols, the masking and the, some of the countries and different cities in Europe were going to a vaccination passport. You have to have your passport to get in uh, to show your shot record and um, recent testing to get into restaurants. But now they've listed them. I would, I just love going into London and to, uh, and to Athens and Rome. And then again, with Barcelona, what we just talked about, I, I just never get tired. And that's always a beginning or ending point of our cruises where we spend some time there. And it's a focal point of land tours when we do the land tour of Spain. That usually includes Madrid um, and, and then Barcelona as well. What, what percentage of the Spanish economy would be wiped out if uh, Catalan went independent? That, that's a very good question. It's often asked there because as 
putting in more euros into the tax fund rather than what they're getting out. They're looking at more than 10% less figures that I heard. And that's substantial. That is really substantial. In a country of 67 million people, if you were to have these people in, well, again, 5 million just in Barcelona, you got to figure in the rest of the Catalonia province are going to all of a sudden be leaving from there. You think all of that huge amount of tourist revenue and all of the service industries, the hotel and, and the, the uh, different service industries that it's headquartered for is not going to be going into Madrid anymore. It's going to stay right there in Barcelona. So if they're losing 10 to 12 percent, it's a huge, huge impact. And you can see why Spain is, is very adamant about not recognizing the independence movement or even the election for an independence movement. Nikki? Yes. Um, I've been to Barcelona three times. The first time was probably 30 years ago, and then 20 years ago, and then two years ago. And my theory is if you've loved a city, you should never go back. <laughs> because this last time, two years ago, it was so crowded with tourists. Before the other two visits, we got to go into the Gaudi apartments, into Gaudi Park. Two years ago, you couldn't even get close to them. You had to stand across the street and look at the buildings instead of going into them. It was very disappointing. So I think if anybody's gonna go to Barcelona, go off season. Absolutely. Because you miss a lot if you don't get to go into the apartments and it, it's just too crowded in the summer. And, and, and the thing is more people are mobile today than ever before. And the crowds that you have there, uh, we mentioned earlier talking to, about Rome. You go there in the middle of July, you're going to stand in line to stand in line to stand in line to go into the Sistine Chapel, another ticket to go into St. Peter's. Go in the, in, in the off season and you walk right in. The same way with these uh, sites here in Barcelona. You go in the middle of the, of the summer, it's wonderful wandering along the Rambla and your coffee shops and the little art community there. But you're shoulder to shoulder with people and standing in line to get in even the most basic of those attractions. Um, if you can do the off season, absolutely do it. And like I said, some of the mystique uh, that you find when you're overwhelmed the first time just is not there on subsequent visits. Um, it, it, it's something that that I keep thinking about because many times as I've I've been, I'm still overwhelmed with whatever new I find in Barcelona or walking the streets of Jerusalem or Istanbul or, or whatever we're doing. My son visited there a year or two ago, and he said that what, what struck him is they didn't want to speak Spanish. He tried to speak some Spanish with them, and they, they resisted that they'd rather talk English than they would uh, Spanish because they wanted to use their own, their own version, you know, the Catalan. Sure. Very, very proud traditions that they have. The cab drivers, I found the same way. I think, well, I want to go somewhere. I'll talk to a cab driver. He's going to be impressed. I'm giving him my best pitch in Spanish. He just shakes his head and goes back to English. <laughs> is the Catalan, is it that much different than Spanish? If you, if you understand one, can you understand the other? You People who speak both will tell me that you pretty much can. Uh, when you've noticed in the show how close some of the words are, Catala and Catalan, Catalonia and Catalonia. Uh, so looking at it, you would see, you could figure it out what it was. And the speakers who speak the Spanish language and the Catalonian language say, you can kind of figure out. And you tell where somebody's from. Ah. What's the climate like? What, what's the winter season? Winter season, of course, is like ours. But uh, with that Mediterranean climate, they don't get the typically disaster type of, uh, of winter weather. Now, Europe has just been hit recently with some unbelievable storms that they had coming across the North Sea. Record winds up in the UK and the rest of Europe buried under some really bad snow conditions. These guys are on the south side of the Pyrenees, so it's kind of protected from some of that area, um, some of that storms in the, the northern part of that area. Pretty much more of a Mediterranean climate, uh, even at those latitudes that are comfortable. Uh, I felt like it was kind of mine. Go there in November, and you, you almost what you got in Birmingham. You know, it, it's not the severe cold, it's a very pleasant fall weather. And, and that's where many people now with the color change, uh, we talked to a, a lady earlier who had been to Montserrat. We get up in the mountains 
go from there. You have some spectacular color change with the um, deciduous trees, the hardwoods. So you combine that with a little inside Barcelona and touring north of there uh, for some of the best color as well. Can I ask, okay. a, question? Can I ask a question? Do you have uh, plans or are plans on the books for going back to live uh, performances anytime soon? Or is it still too early with the uh, COVID protocols? Well, uh, Ellen just announced earlier today that uh, we're going to probably do Zoom for the uh, spring term. Okay. But uh, everybody hopes we can get back to in-person and uh, hopefully in the fall we'll do that. Okay. Well, it's certainly been my pleasure to meet with everyone again. If you yeah. have any yeah. other questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. If not, I certainly Look forward to visiting with you again. I hope you'll keep me in mind when uh, looking for another part of the world or maybe some other bit of uh, historical significance comes up. Well, thank you. Thank you, Nikki. I think everybody here would agree that you're one of our favorite speakers and we want you back for sure. Thank you very much. You've made my thank day. Thanks, Nikki. Thank thank and all of you, uh, please, please join us tomorrow uh, for the last of our winter terms Yes, uh, talks uh, by my son who's coming to talk to you about uh, the viruses and what he's doing in his work in, the, in Berkeley to uh, hopefully eradicate it. So we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.